By request, here's an updated and expanded edition of my AZ500 video practice exam. 120 questions across all four exam domains, complete with explanations, annotated notes, allowing you to assess your readiness domain by domain, objective by objective, narrated by yours truly. I hope you like it. Let's dig in. Welcome to my AZ500 exam cram video practice exam. This practice exam covers all four exam domains. This is the one that earns you the Azure Security Engineer Associate certification. Just to set some expectations before you walk into the exam, this is both a very technically broad and deep technical exam. And at that associate level, Microsoft expects that you have two years of hands-on experience, so you can't win this one with just memorization alone. To help you get over the finish line in addition to this practice exam, I'll provide free access to my AZ500 exam prep resources, the study guide and video exam prep resources, both here on YouTube as well as on LinkedIn Learning, which have been updated for the latest and greatest version of the exam as of January 2022. You will also find a copy of the PDF version of the practice exam questions that you'll see in this video. The link is available in the video description. And just a couple of quick notes on how this video practice exam is set up to work. We have 120 practice questions with explanations narrated so you can listen anywhere by me. Questions for all four AZ500 exam domains. Touching on all the concepts in the exam where we can, but not intended to reproduce actual exam questions. It's intended to ensure that you really know the material and to allow you to assess your weaknesses as you progress on a per concept and per domain basis to ensure that you're ready for the exam really. And the way the questions are set up, you'll see the objective domain at the top of the screen. There are four domains for AZ500. You'll see the question in the gray box, the possible answers below, and once those answers have been revealed, the 15 second timer that counts down to the answer reveal. You'll see the answer in the yellow box. You'll see the explanation below, and I will provide some additional context for this answer, including some handwritten notes that I think you'll find helpful for exam day. Remember, you can get the PDF copy of these questions with the link in the video description. And that's what you're in for? So let's get started. Domain one, question one. Azure AD Privileged Identity Management supports which of the following features when users request to activate a privileged identity profile? A ticket number in a help desk system, an explanation of why they need to activate the profile, approval by an admin, or all of the above. So which of these are supported by Azure AD PIM? So any combination of one, two, and three, or four, all of the above. And the answer is in fact all of the above. Azure AD Privileged Identity Management supports all three of these options alone or in any combination. Question two, Azure APIs can be protected by configuration of permission scopes to limit access to a third-party web app even when users consent. True or false? So Azure APIs can be protected by a configuration of permission scopes to limit access to a third-party web app even when the user consents to access. And the answer is true. Admins can configure permission scopes ahead of any user consent. Question three. In the OAuth code grant flow, the user confirms consent by providing a code back to the app, Option two, entering their password when prompted. Three, by either providing a code or entering their password. Or four, none of the above. So how does the user confirm consent in the OAuth code grant flow? And 
And the answer is by providing a code back to the app, option one. So in that OAuth code grant flow, the user confirms consent by entering a code into a text box provided. Question four. Azure AD pass-through authentication is associated with which of the following identity models? Option one, cloud only. Option two, synchronized. Three, federated. Or four, all of the above. So which of these identity models is associated with pass-through authentication in Azure AD? Incidentally, that synchronized model is the most widely deployed today. And the answer is, in fact, synchronized. So because it passes the authentication request through to the on-premises Active Directory, pass-through authentication is associated only with that synchronized identity model. Uh, the on-premises passwords are never stored in the cloud, and folks use that pass-through authentication option sometimes for regulatory concerns that they want to uh, ensure that they only authenticate on-prem. Other times, they're doing it to take advantage of controls present in Active Directory that are not present in Azure AD, like logon hours. And question five, which of the following identities eliminate the need for credentials in code? Managed identities, service principles, managed identities and service principles, or none of the above. You'll definitely see questions around managed identities and service principles on the exam, managed identities being the most recent of those concepts to be introduced in Azure, although it's been quite a while back now. And our answer is number one, managed identity. So managed identities eliminate the need to manage credentials. They are service principles of a special type, which are locked to only be used with Azure resources. And question six, with Azure Active Directory multi-factor authentication, you can automatically block authentication for users who report fraud via email to a support address. True or false? So can you automatically block authentication for users who report fraud via email to a support address? True or false? Definitely users are able to report potential fraud. And the answer here is false. Users can report fraud, but they do so using a code via phone. And the code is zero by default, although you can change that. Question seven. You can activate an eligible privileged identity profile. One, via the Microsoft Authenticator app. Two, via the Azure Privileged Identity app in the Azure portal. Three, in the properties of your Office 365 user profile or four, all of the above. So what are your options for activating an eligible privileged identity profile in the privileged identity management or PIM feature of Azure AD? And the answer is two, via the Azure Privileged Identity app in the Azure portal. Activating a profile is performed within the PIM app in the portal, end of story. Question eight, you can create new users in Azure AD with the create-Azure AD user commandlet, true or false? So how do you create users in Azure AD using PowerShell? Is it the create-Azure AD user commandlet or something else? Again, the exam is very technical. PowerShell questions will definitely be in scope and our answer for number eight is false. It's actually the new dash Azure AD user commandlet that's used to create new users in Azure AD. So for AZ500, it's definitely going to pay dividends to be familiar with both the commandlets in Azure AD PowerShell and Azure PowerShell as it relates to the concepts that you see in the skills measured. So question nine. Azure Container Registry supports Kubernetes and Docker running on third-party cloud platforms.
true or false. So remember Azure Container Registry is that service that hosts your container images. So can we access images in an Azure Container Registry from our Kubernetes and Docker running in third-party cloud platforms? The answer is true. Azure Container Registry is a Docker registry. It doesn't disallow access from clouds other than Azure at all, uh, assuming you authenticate uh, to the standards you've configured. And when Microsoft Defender for Container Registries is enabled, any image you push to your registry will be scanned immediately. Question 10. You're planning on rolling out a new Azure AD conditional access policy to restrict access to only specific device platforms. Which of the following device platforms is not supported? Android, iOS, Chrome OS, or none of the above. Which of the following device platforms is not supported? Android, iOS, Chrome OS, or are none of these answers correct? In other words, are all of these supported? The answer is three, Chrome OS. So Chrome OS is not natively supported for device compliance and conditional access policies, but Android, iOS, Windows, and Mac OS all certainly are. Question 11. You can configure an Azure AD conditional access policy for specific client applications such as Microsoft Word, true or false. So can you configure an Azure AD conditional access policy for a specific client application or applications like Microsoft Word or Excel or PowerPoint or Outlook? And the answer is true. Conditional access can be scoped for specific apps, limited to compliant devices, uh, limited by sign-in risk, and several other options. Question 12. Microsoft Azure AD Identity Protection evaluates risk associated with users and sign-in attempts, users, users and devices, or users, sign-in attempts, and devices. So our options here are one, users and sign-in attempts, two, users, three, users and devices, or four, essentially, all of the above. And our answer is users and sign-in attempts. So Azure AD Identity Protection evaluates risk associated to your users and your sign-in attempts, and you can configure your limits for risk for user risk and sign-in risk separately. So that allows us to set our thresholds for dealing with a user that we see risky activity happening, perhaps on an ongoing basis where that user has been flagged as risky, as well as addressing risk around a specific sign-in attempt but know the difference between user risk and sign-in risk for the exam. Question 13. Admin consent in Azure Active Directory grants consent on behalf of 1. A specific user 2. All users 3. A specific user or device or 4. None of the above. So admin consent in Azure Active Directory grants consent on behalf of all users, a specific user, a specific user or device, or none of the above. And the answer here is two, all users. So admin consent grants consent on behalf of all users, tenant-wide essentially. Admins can control the scope of a user's ability to consent as well including limiting permissions they may consent to or disabling user consent altogether. Question 14. Azure AD Connect or Azure AD Cloud Sync can be used to configure which of the following identity models? Is it one, cloud only? Two, synchronized and federated? Three, synchronized? Or four, all of the above? So which of these Azure Active Directory identity models can Azure AD Connect 
or Azure AD Connect Cloud Sync be used to configure? And the answer is synchronized and federated, option two. So both the synchronized and federated models leverage Azure AD Connect or Azure AD Connect Cloud Sync. If you're not familiar with Azure AD Connect Cloud Sync, that is simply a cloud service version of Azure AD Connect, which historically we've installed on premises in a VM. Question 15. Security groups and Microsoft 365 groups can both be used to secure Azure resources. True or false? So you may remember that Microsoft 365 groups trigger the creation of additional resources. But can we use those Microsoft 365 groups also to secure Azure resources? True or false? The answer is true. So Microsoft 365 groups, which used to be called Office 365 groups, can be used to secure resources just like security groups, but they also include additional functionality for enabling collaboration. And question 16, you can configure access reviews in Azure AD Privileged Identity Management to be self-completed by the eligible members of the privileged roles. True or false? So can we allow our eligible members for the privileged roles that we configure in the PIM feature of Azure AD to perform their own access review on a periodic basis? And the answer is true, we can. Uh, you can allow designated reviewers to make these decisions owners or the eligible role members themselves. And you can also configure effect to role eligibility when a self-reviewer fails to respond, such as take no action or revoke access. Question 17. You need to continually evaluate the security posture of all identities in Azure Active Directory. You need to provide risk level, risk events, and current status. What should you configure? Is it one, Azure AD conditional access? Two, Azure AD identity protection? Three, Microsoft Cloud App Security? Or four, privileged identity management? So which of these features will allow us to provide information around risk level and events and the current risk status of our users in Azure AD? And the answer is two, Azure AD Identity Protection. It's a tool that allows organizations to automate the detection and remediation of identity-based risks and to investigate risks using data in the portal. And question 18, you can configure Azure AD conditional access policies to target only users in untrusted locations, true or false? So with Azure AD conditional access policies, can we target only the users in untrusted locations or do we have to include users in our trusted sites as well? So how can we scope that feature? So the answer is true. Conditional access can be scoped to specific users, apps, and limited to compliant devices, sign-in risk, and more. So for the exam, know that basically if we select all trusted locations, on the exclude tab under conditions locations, then only untrusted locations will be evaluated by that policy. So if we set up our trusted locations in Azure AD, we'll be able to scope these policies down to really give our users those additional authentication prompts when they're not on a managed device inside the four walls of our company offices. And that's an important real world consideration. If you're prompting users in the office on your managed devices with multi-factor prompts all day long, you're going to have some annoyed users. Question 19. When configuring single sign-on for hybrid users, you need to ensure that all user passwords are evaluated by the on-premises Active Directory domain controller. What action will you take? One. Configure group right back in Azure AD Connect. Two, add users to a privileged identity management profile. Three, 
create an Azure AD conditional access policy, or four, configure Azure AD pass-through authentication. So what will we do to ensure all user passwords are evaluated by the on-premises Active Directory domain controller? And the answer is four, configure pass-through authentication. So Azure AD pass-through authentication allows single sign-on for on-premises and cloud-based apps by validating user passwords directly against on-premises Active Directory. And this opens the door for leveraging some Active Directory features that aren't present in Azure AD, like logon hours. Question 20. You need to secure all guest user identities by only allowing logging into Microsoft Teams via Windows endpoints, always enforcing multi-factor authentication. What should you implement to accomplish this goal? Is it one, privileged identity management? Two, Azure AD identity protection. Three, pass-through authentication. Or four, Azure AD conditional access. So which feature will we leverage to ensure that our guest users always receive that MFA prompt when logging into Microsoft Teams? And the answer is four, Azure AD conditional access. So conditional access supports rule configuration based on platform, app, risk, location, and more. So domain one of this exam is manage identity and access after all. So you can definitely expect some questions around Azure AD because that's Microsoft's identity platform. Question 21, what is the minimum Azure RBAC role required to view Azure Monitor logs? Is it one, security administrator, two, monitoring contributor, three, monitoring administrator, or four, monitoring reader? So what is the minimum Azure RBAC role required to view Azure Monitor logs? You can definitely expect to see some questions testing your knowledge of native roles in Azure AD and Azure. And the answer? is four, monitoring reader. So the monitoring reader role has read-only access to monitoring data, which raises an important point about the exam. Always choose your answers with least privilege access in mind. There may be multiple answers for a question on the exam that technically meet the need, but there's only going to be one best answer in any case. So filtering down to the answer that implements least privilege access is always going to be a good option to getting to the right answer. Question 22. Transferring a subscription to a new Azure AD tenant will cause Azure VMs to stop running. True or false? Transferring a subscription to a new Azure AD tenant will cause Azure VMs to stop running. So definitely a possible operation we'd see in an enterprise as an organization grows. And the answer is false. This transfer will result in Azure role assignments being permanently deleted because we're moving to a new tenant. It will impact managed identities because we're moving to a new Azure AD tenant. The VMs will not stop running, but you will have to re-enable or recreate any managed identities used by those VMs after the transfer. Number 23, an app registration in Azure Active Directory creates an application object as well as a service principle that can access resources. True or false? So when we create an app registration in Azure Active Directory, are we actually creating two objects or just one? You can definitely expect multiple questions on app registration on the exam. So our answer is true. So the application object is actually a global representation of the app in the tenant where the app is registered. And the service principle is the local concrete instance present in each tenant where the app is used. So the service principle is the actual identity. Think of that app object as the template of sorts. 
And if you look in the video description, I have a link to my video titled Azure AD App Registration in Plain English, Exam Prep FAQs, also here on YouTube. Question 24. For app registration, what are the permission types supported by the Microsoft Identity Platform? Choose two. So one, delegated permissions. Two, explicit permissions. Three, inherited permissions. And four, application permissions. So for app registration, there are two types of permissions. Which two are correct? Delegated, explicit, inherited, and application are your options. And the answer is delegated permissions and application permissions. So delegated permissions are used by apps that have a signed in user present, so a human at the keyboard. Application permissions are used by apps that run without a signed in user present. So think of apps running, say, as a service, for example. 25. What is the format of an OpenID Connect token? Is it one, YAML, two, XML, three, JWT, which is JSON Web Token, or four, SAML? So what is the format of an OpenID Connect token? So from domain one on the AZ500 exam, I can expect that you might see questions around OpenID or OAuth2, either one, or maybe questions on both. And the answer in this case is three, JWT. So your OpenID tokens are JSON web token format. They're sent to the client application as part of an OpenID Connect flow, and they're used by the client to authenticate the user. 26. What is the minimum required license to enable Azure AD conditional access for a user? So one, Azure AD Premium Plan 2. Two, Microsoft 365 Business. Three, Microsoft 365 E3. Or four, Azure AD Premium Plan 1. And you notice there that Plan 1 and Plan 2 are sometimes abbreviated as simply P1 or P2. I don't expect you'll see very many licensing questions on the exam because this is a technical exam, but there are some elements that may come up here as you're talking about features. In this case, the answer is Azure AD Premium Plan 1. And for the exam, I would expect if you see anything related to licensing, it's going to be sorting out features that only show up in Azure AD Premium Plan 1 and those that show up in Plan 2. For example, Identity Protection only shows up in Azure AD Premium Plan 2. Privileged Identity Management also requires Plan 2. Question 27. In Privileged Identity Management in Azure AD, what are the available settings when an assigned reviewer does not complete the review before the configured review ends? You can pick any combination of these four. One is no change. Two is remove access. Three is approve access. And four is disable account. So in the PIM feature, what are the available settings when the assigned reviewer does not complete the review? So this could include when we ask users to self-review and tell us if they still need to be eligible for that privileged role. So what combination of these are options? So our potential outcomes here are one, no change, two, remove access, three, approve access. So essentially anything except the disable account option that wouldn't be an option. So you have a variety of options in PIM reviews that enable us to remove access from users that don't bother to respond, to leave the existing in place. Another option, take recommendations, is also available. So 28 is difficult. When multiple Azure Active Directory conditional access policies apply to a user, which of the following are true? Choose all that apply. One, policies are not applied in a particular order. Two, block access takes priority over all settings. Three, policies are applied in order by created date. And four, policies with device settings take precedence. So in other words, policies with device settings take higher priority. 
which of these four are true when multiple Azure AD conditional access policies apply to a user? And the answer is options one and two. So for every sign-in, Azure AD evaluates all policies and it ensures that all requirements in all applicable policies are met before granting access to the user. Block access takes priority over all other configuration settings. So those policies are all evaluated in no particular order, but block access is the override, the, the highest priority. 29. When configuring an app registration in Azure AD, in which area of the registration do you configure the services the application can access? Is it one, in the manifest? Two, the authentication blade? Three, the API permissions blade? Or four, the roles and administrators blade? So where in the Azure AD app registration do we configure the services the application can access? And the answer is three, the API permissions blade. You can choose add a permission in the API permissions blade to add those accessible services. App registration, definitely one of the most common areas I see questions from exam candidates. Make sure you go back and watch that video I mentioned that's dedicated to going end to end on the app registration process. And 30. Blank and blank are required for access for an application that has been registered with Azure AD for modern user authentication. So you need to fill in these two blanks that are required for access for an application registered in Azure AD for modern user auth. So the tenant ID and the client ID. Two, the client ID and client secret. Three, client ID and redirect URL, or four, tenant ID and client secret. So you need to choose one here. Blank and blank are required for access for an application that has been registered with Azure AD for modern auth. And the answer is two, client ID and client secret. So think of the client ID and the client secret as the user and the password. The redirect URI is the location that the authorization server will send the user to once the app has been successfully authorized and granted an authorization code or an access token. 31. You need to delegate access to an admin for a VM named VM1 in the Contoso VM resource group. They should have full control over the VM but they should not be able to grant access to other users. What permissions will you assign? So option one, we scope the permissions at the Contoso VM resource group with the role of owner. Option two, we scope at the resource group level with the role of contributor. Option three, we scope the role of owner at the VM level. Or option four, we scope the role of contributor at the VM1 VM level. So which option will we use to assign full control over the VM but to disallow granting access to other users? And the answer is four, scope to VM1 and a role of contributor. So the contributor role grants access to all rights except the ability to grant rights to others. Now scoping to the VM object only ensures permissions are not granted to other VMs in the resource group. That one's tricky. It might be that we have multiple VMs that are tied to a single application and maybe share the same lifecycle. 32. Which of the following roles can manage assignments for other administrators in privileged identity management for Azure AD roles. So one, global administrator, two, security administrator, three, security reader, and four, privileged role administrator. So which of these roles, and you can choose all that apply, can manage assignments for other administrators and privileged identity management for Azure AD roles? And that's important, it's calling out Azure AD roles, not Azure roles. And the answer 
is one, global administrator, and four, privileged role administrator. So the global administrator who enables privileged identity management for an organization automatically gets role assignments and access to PIM. And that first user can then assign others the privileged role administrator role so they can manage the PIM feature. 33. Which of the following roles are required to manage assignments for other administrators in PIM, Privileged Identity Management, for Azure resource roles? Is it one, Subscription Administrator, two, Resource Administrator, three, Privileged Role Administrator, four, Security Administrator? So the key difference between this question and the last is now we're talking about Azure resource roles, not Azure AD roles. So which of these roles are required to manage assignments for other administrators for Azure resource roles? The answer is two, resource administrator. So a user cannot manage privilege identity management for resources without resource administrator permission. Now we're moving on to domain two, which is implement platform protection. And question one, Azure Update Management can patch both Windows and Linux VMs. True or false? So can we patch both Windows and Linux virtual machines with the update management feature in Azure? And the answer? True. The Azure Update Management feature supports patching both supported Windows and several Linux distributions. Number two, network security groups or NSGs include a rule to allow RDP access on which port by default? Is it TCP port 22? Is it TCP 443? Number three, is it TCP 3389 or none of the above? So NSGs include a rule to allow RDP access on which port by default? And the answer is four, none of the above. There is no rule configured to enable remote access to an Azure VM by default. Number three, physical isolation in Azure Kubernetes service provides the highest pod density for running workloads. True or false? So if we physically isolate Azure Kubernetes services pods, do we get greater density or lesser density in physical isolation? The answer here is false. Separate physical nodes result in lower pod density and greater management overhead. So logical isolation, shared infrastructure. So think shared physical clusters are going to give us greater pod density and lower management overhead. So, so watch for that keyword there which is physical. Number four, the Azure Virtual Network Container Network Interface, or CNI, enables advanced networking for the following container solutions. Choose the best answer from the list. One, Azure Kubernetes Service. Two, AKS Engine. Three, Docker Containers. Four, all of the above. So which solutions does the Azure Virtual Network Container Network Interface support? You're definitely going to see quite a bit of coverage of Kubernetes on this exam. Really expect it. And the answer here is all of the above. So Azure Virtual Network CNI supports Azure Kubernetes Service, AKS Engine, as well as Docker. And incidentally, it also works with Kubernetes resources like services, ingress controllers, and kubeDNS. So the CNI installs in an Azure VM and assigns an IP address to every pod, and a pod can consist of one or more containers. Five, the following are the available types of Azure resource locks. 
Choose the best answer. One, cannot delete and read only. Two, cannot delete, read only, and no access. Three, cannot delete and no access. Four, cannot delete. So what are the available types of Azure resource locks? So when we think about governance, resource locks come to mind. It allows us to prevent uh, actions on our infrastructure that we want to prevent. And the answer here is one, cannot delete and read only. So the two resource lock types are cannot delete, which prevents deletion and read only, which prevents any writable actions that would change the configuration of that resource. But when I think of governance and automation through Azure policy, resource locks is another topic that comes hand in hand with that discussion. And number six, the following resources support Azure Resource Firewall. Choose the best answer. One, Azure SQL and storage accounts. Two, Azure SQL and Azure VMs. Three, Azure VMs and storage accounts. And four, storage accounts. So which of these resources support Azure Resource Firewalls? And time, and our answer for number six is Azure SQL servers and databases, as well as Azure storage accounts support resource firewall. There are certainly other PaaS services that support resource firewall. Those are the two uh, amongst that list that support that resource firewall feature. So you want to be familiar with resource firewall hands-on, but notice I mentioned Azure SQL servers and databases. So I can configure those firewall rules at a server level in Azure SQL as well as at a database level. Important distinction. Number seven, the standard tier of Microsoft Defender for Cloud is required to capture data on resource security hygiene. True or false? So in Microsoft Defender for Cloud, formerly Azure Security Center, do we need the standard tier in order to capture data on resource security hygiene? The answer here is false. The standard tier is not required. The free tier of Defender for Cloud will also provide information on resource security hygiene. It's when we get into the intelligent features, those that uh, formerly carried the label advanced threat protection, and when we get into hybrid features such as managing on-premises VMs, that's where we need to move up to the standard tier. If there's intelligence or machine learning involved, or it's a hybrid function, that's where you're really thinking about the standard tier. Number eight in domain two, to provide full access to the resources in an Azure resource group, you should grant only the contributor role for the subscription. True or false? I want you to read this question carefully. I want you to think carefully about least privilege access as you're thinking about the right answer to this question. To provide full access to the resources in a resource group, we grant the contributor role for the subscription. True or false? The answer is false. There's no need to grant permissions at the subscription level. Scope is the important element here. Always apply the rule of least privilege when configuring RBAC in Azure, which means we would apply that contributor role at the resource group level. And remember, Contributor, broadly speaking, provides all permissions except the permission to grant permissions to others for the resource that you're assigning that role to. And you'll see that contributor role scope down to specific features, but remember the contributor role provides all permissions except the ability to grant access to others. Number nine. You will configure a separate front door instance to route requests by URL path to different backend pools. True or false? So front door is a global load balancing solution for HTTPS. 
you'd use traffic manager for non-HTTPS. So the answer here is false. URL path-based routing allows you to route traffic to backend pools based on URL paths of the request. This can be accommodated from a single front door instant. So if you're not familiar with your local and global load balancing options for HTTPS and non-HTTPS traffic, go have a look at my AZ500 exam prep course over on LinkedIn Learning. Uh, in my study guide, you'll find some time-limited free access. Number 10, you need to block outbound internet traffic from Azure VMs while allowing global access to Azure storage with minimum administrative effort. Which technology will you use? One, Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps. This used to be called Microsoft Cloud App Security. Number two, Network Security Groups. Three, Application Security Groups. Or number four, Azure Application Gateway. So our goal is to block outbound internet traffic from an Azure VM while allowing global access to Azure storage with minimum effort. Which technology is going to get us there best? And the answer is two, a network security group. So NSG service tags allow you to block outbound access to the internet, but still allow access to Azure storage in the same region for diagnostics and metrics. And remember, we can apply security groups to a subnet or to a network interface on a VM. Number 11, Azure Firewall requires you to specify the number of network virtual appliances according to your expected scale needs. True or false? So does Azure Firewall require us to specify the number of network virtual appliances according to our expected scale needs? Do we have to supply an exact number? Do we have to supply a range? Or is it something different? So the answer is false. We don't have to supply the number. In fact, high availability and auto scale are built into the service. There is no network virtual appliance count necessary. And while we're talking Azure Firewall for the exam, make sure you're familiar with Azure Firewall Manager for central policy management of multiple firewalls and the requirements for Azure Firewall Manager. Number 12. Azure VMs can communicate across VNets, virtual networks, by default. True or false? An Azure VM can communicate with other Azure VMs across VNets in your Azure subscription by default. True or false? And the answer is false. So VMs within the same virtual network, within the same VNet, do have connectivity by default, even if they're on different subnets, as long as they're within the same VNet. Communication between virtual machines in separate VNets, in other words, across VNets, requires either VNet peering or VPN connectivity between those virtual networks. And number 13, you plan to secure remote access from your on-premises network to your AKS cluster with minimum network latency and maximum security. Which solution will you choose? Is it one, site-to-site -site VPN? Two, point-to-site -site VPN? Three, Azure VNet peering? Or four, Azure Express Route? So I wanna just point out here, minimum network latency and maximum security. So we want to secure remote access from our on-premises network to our AKS cluster with minimum latency and maximum security. So bear those two things in mind when you choose your answer, because this is one of those cases where we have multiple options that will provide that connectivity, but which meets those criteria is the million dollar question. And the answer is for Azure Express Route. So Azure Express Route does not use the public internet Therefore, increasing security and control over network performance. So remember, on AZ500, you're definitely going to encounter questions where multiple answers will meet some aspect of the need. In this case, we were looking for the solution that would meet the finer grained criteria. 
Number 14, VMs included in an application security group cannot be located in different Azure regions. True or false? So VMs in an application security group cannot be located in different Azure regions. Is that true or false? And the answer is in fact true. Members of an application security group must be located within the same Azure region. I find that candidates are typically more familiar with network security groups and less familiar with application security groups. Make sure you get your arms around both of these before exam day. Number 15, Microsoft best practices recommend adding additional layers of access control security to Azure SQL databases. Which feature will you implement? Is it one, Azure Active Directory conditional access, two, Azure App Gateway, three, a network security group, or four, Azure SQL Server level firewall rule. So we need to add an additional layer of access control security to an Azure SQL database. Which feature will we implement? And the answer is four, Azure SQL Server Firewall Rule. So you can create a server level firewall rule for single databases and pooled databases. And remember for Azure SQL, the resource firewall feature works at the server level and at the database level. 16, to achieve high availability for VMs in an Azure region, the following options are available. One, availability sets and Azure site recovery. Two, availability sets, availability zones, and Azure Site Recovery. Three, availability sets and availability zones. Or four, Azure Site Recovery and availability zones. So to achieve high availability for VMs in an Azure region, think within an Azure region, what are our options? And the answer is three, availability sets and availability zones. The key here is in a region. Both availability sets and availability zones give us high availability within the region. Azure Site Recovery delivers disaster recovery, DR, not HA. 17, the service principle required by Azure Kubernetes Service can be created by the following methods. One, automatically during AKS deployment via the Azure CLI. Two, manually using the Azure CLI before AKS deployment. Three, no service principle is required for AKS. Or four, option one or two. So the service principle required by Azure Kubernetes service can be created by which of the following methods? And the answer is four, numbers one or two. We can do it manually before deployment or automatically during deployment via Azure CLI. But both manual and automatic service principle creation is supported. Ideally, you would instead use a managed identity, which can be enabled only during cluster creation. Remember, managed identity is the newest construct in the, the realm of service principles. You're going to see managed identity, I should think, more than anything when we talk about identities for resources in Azure. 18, SSH is disabled on Azure Kubernetes service nodes by default. True or false? So is SSH disabled on AKS nodes by default? That's going to be an important element of management and operations. And the answer is false. AKS allows SSH from private IPs by default. But the key there is from private IPs. 19. You need to enforce that all new resources are created in specific Azure regions. You create an Azure policy. Does this meet your objective? Yes or no? 
So I need to enforce that all new resources are created in specific Azure regions. Can I implement that control with an Azure policy? Yes or no? And the answer is yes. You can assign a policy to enforce a condition for resources that you create in the future. For the exam, you should also know what initiatives and blueprints are as well. Initiative is a group of policies or a collection of policies grouped together to achieve a common goal. And blueprints are for governed environments. So if you see the word environment and the answer involves policy or blueprints, when environments are involved, blueprints is almost certainly going to be the answer. Number 20, you can enforce the following scanning options for your container images for Azure Kubernetes service. One, in the Azure Container Registry. Two, at design time in Visual Studio Code. Three, in the AKS Container Runtime. Or four, options one and three. So when can we configure scanning options for our container images for AKS? In our Container Registry, in Visual Studio Code, in the Container Runtime, or a combination thereof. The answer here is one in the Azure Container Registry and three in the AKS Container Runtime. So scanning in both of these areas is an option for our containerized services. And for best security, you really should be scanning them in both of these places. 21, what are the two distinct modes of runtime isolation for Windows containers? One, process. Two, global. Three, Hyper-V. Four, local. So what are the two distinct modes of runtime isolation for Windows containers? You need to choose two here. And the answer here is one, process, and three, Hyper-V. So with process isolation mode, containers share the same kernel with the host as well as each other. With Hyper-V isolation, each container effectively gets its own kernel. Number 22, which of the following can be associated to a network security group? Select all that apply. One, a virtual network or VNet. Two, a subnet. Three, a resource group. Or four, a network interface card or NIC. That would be a NIC within a virtual machine. So which of the following can be associated to an NSG? A VNet, a subnet, a resource group, or a NIC? I'll give you a hint there. The answer are two of these. And the answer is two, subnet, and four, NIC. So you can configure NSGs on a subnet and a network interface card, and you can use these two together if desired as well. 23, which of the following options can be used to create custom RBAC roles? Select all that apply. One, Azure PowerShell. Two, Azure CLI. Three, REST API. Or four, ARM template. Which of these are options for creating custom RBAC roles? And custom RBAC roles are a distinct skill measured, so you can expect you might even see multiple questions. You want to be very familiar with hands-on creation. And the answer here is Azure PowerShell, Azure CLI, and REST API, numbers 1, 2, and 3. These are all valid options for creating custom RBAC, and you can configure an existing custom RBAC role with an ARM template. 24. You need to configure a reverse proxy for TLS termination for inbound access to an Azure Kubernetes cluster. What option do you deploy? 1. Azure Firewall. 2. Ingress Controller. 3. Container Network Interface Plugin. Or 4. Azure Application Gateway. 
So what's our option for reverse proxy for TLS termination for inbound access to an Azure Kubernetes cluster? And the answer is two, ingress controller. So an ingress controller is a piece of software that provides reverse proxy, configurable traffic routing, and TLS termination for Kubernetes services. 25. Microsoft Defender for Cloud includes a quick fix option to add a vulnerability assessment solution to your Azure virtual machines. Which partner option is integrated with Defender for this feature? Is it 1. Rapid7, 2. Nessus, 3. Qualys, 4. Thales? So this is a bit of an unusual scenario in that a third party is licensed in Defender for that standard tier by default to provide that functionality. And the answer is three, Qualys. So this VM scanning capability from Qualys was incorporated into the standard tier of Microsoft Defender for Cloud with simplified deployment at no additional charge. It's worth mentioning that you could configure this feature kind of on the free tier, but it requires that you have your own Qualys licensing. But on the standard tier, this is incorporated into Defender for Cloud with simplified deployment at no charge. 26. The following security principles may be granted rights to a resource group. 1. Service principle. 2. Managed identity. 3. Azure AD user, four, all of the above. So which of these security principles may be granted rights to a resource group? Azure AD user, managed identity, service principle, or all of the above? And the answer is four, all of the above. So with options one, two, and three, they're all security principles and we can grant resource group access to any of them. 27. What are the options for configuring a custom RBAC role in Azure AD? We talked more generally about custom RBAC roles earlier, so now we're talking about in Azure AD. So your options are PowerShell, 2. Azure Portal, 3. REST API, 4. All of the above. So what are our options for configuring a custom RBAC role in Azure AD? Choose the best answer. We're all that apply here, certainly. And the answer again is all the above. Custom RBAC roles can be configured both in the Azure portal and programmatically. Make sure you get hands-on access to this feature Custom RBAC roles were added at some point back in 2021 to the exam. Uh, so you're definitely going to see uh, a question on here. 28. You need to ensure that all your Azure VMs have a consistent operating system configuration at deploy time. Which of the following options would you configure? 1. ARM templates. 2. Desired state configuration. 3 application security groups, or four, device configuration policies. So read this carefully. You need to ensure that all your Azure VMs have a consistent operating system configuration at deploy time. And the answer here is two, desired state configuration, or DSC. DSC will enable policy-based configuration of the OS, and it's used by management features like Azure Update Management. 29. You're configuring an Azure Firewall instance. You want to ensure all traffic from an Azure subnet going to www.kinetico.com is routed through the Azure Firewall. Which option should you implement? 1. A network rule. 2. Route table. 3. Application Rule. 4. Network Security Group. So we're trying to force all the traffic from an Azure subnet that's going to a specific URL or FQDN to go through the firewall. Which option do we implement? 
The answer here is three, an application rule. You can configure application rules that define fully qualified domain names, FQDNs, that can be accessed from a subnet, and network rules that define source address, protocol, destination port, and address. But for the exam, at a higher level, know the difference between NAT rules, network rules, and application rules in Azure Firewall. Number 30. Contoso host Azure resources, which they have shared with users from Kinetico Corp. Both organizations have their own Azure AD tenant. So which tenant owns the user lifecycle in this external identity scenario? Is it the account tenant? Is it two, the resource tenant? Three, Microsoft? Or four, it depends. So in this scenario, the account tenant is Kinetico Corp. That's where the credentials live that are being granted guest access. And the resource tenant is Contoso, where the resources which have been shared are hosted. I expect this terminology might be new to some of you, so I wanted to include this question. The answer is to the resource tenant. The resource tenant being Contoso, they own the life cycle of guest account access. And when they want to revoke guest access, they can do that at any time. The account tenant is Kinetico, which owns the credentials in the Kinetico Azure AD tenant that was granted guest access. So if you're not too familiar with external identity scenarios, look at that video in my AZ500 exam prep 2 course on LinkedIn Learning. I have a free link in the video description. 31. Which modes are available for rules in Azure Web Application Firewall? Choose two. One, block mode. Two, prevention mode. Three, detection mode. And four, report only mode. So which two modes are available for rules in Azure Web Application Firewall? And the answer is two, prevention mode, and three, detection mode. So WAF has those two modes. Detection mode monitors and logs all threat alerts, and prevention mode blocks intrusions and attacks that the rules detect. And WAF is based on the core rule set from OWASP, so you're protecting from the OWASP top 10 right out of the box. And if you look at Create and Configure Web App Firewall in my AZ500 Exam Prep 2 course, if you're not familiar with Web App Firewall, you should get familiar with this. It's, it's a very commonly used component. 32. How do you enable the basic tier of Azure DDoS for your Azure subscriptions? Is it 1. Configure an Azure DDoS instance. 2. Enable Azure DDoS within Microsoft Defender. 3. No action is necessary. So how do we enable the basic tier of Azure DDoS? Which, as you might guess, is protecting against distributed denial of service network attacks. And the answer here is no action is necessary. The Azure DDoS basic tier is enabled by default in the Azure platform, which constantly monitors traffic and enforces real-time mitigation of the most common network attacks no configuration or cost uh, for that basic tier. The standard tier requires configuration, it brings additional features, and it brings considerable additional cost. 33, wrapping up domain two. You want to ensure all access for all Azure SQL instances from a specific VNet does not traverse the public internet. Which solution will you implement? Is it one, private link, two, service endpoint, three, private endpoint, or four, site-to-site -site VPN? So we want to ensure access for all Azure SQL instances from a specific VNet does not traverse the public internet. And the answer here is two, service endpoint. And the key there is all instances. Service endpoint is configured at the VNet level for all instances of a PaaS service 
optimizing traffic routing over the Azure Backbone network. Now, technically, the destination IP is still a public IP, but it's accessed via the Azure Backbone. If you want a private IP and access to a private IP within a VNet, that's where you need a private endpoint. And a private endpoint works for a specific service instance. So the key with service endpoint is we're covering all instances of a PaaS service and we're just optimizing routing to the public IP over the Azure Backbone. So for the exam, know the difference between private link, private endpoint, and service endpoint. These are common areas of confusion. Moving on to domain three, which is manage security operations. Question one, Azure Monitor can be used to alert on events of interest to security operations, true or false? So can we actually use Azure Monitor to send alerts related to security? We really think about Azure Monitor as, as service monitoring, more focused on IT operations. And the answer, is true. Events from the administrative and security categories of the activity log are definitely of interest to SecOps and we can use Azure Monitor to find an alert on events of interest. Question two, which Microsoft tool is designed to help identify and mitigate potential application security issues early in the software development lifecycle? Is it one, Microsoft Defender for Cloud? Two, Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool, three, Microsoft Compliance Manager, or four, Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps. So which tool is designed to help mitigate potential application security issues early in the software development cycle? And the answer is the Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool. Uh, which enables software architects to evaluate designs using the STRIDE threat modeling methodology, which is both widely used and incidentally actually developed originally by Microsoft. Question three, the VM vulnerability scanning feature in Microsoft Defender can also scan for vulnerabilities in open source databases on Azure VMs, true or false? So does that VM vulnerability scanning feature in Microsoft Defender also work on open source databases like PostgreSQL and MariaDB? And the answer is false. Only Microsoft SQL on VMs is available with this feature. Question four, the free tier of Microsoft Defender for Cloud can identify deficiencies in baseline Azure network configuration, such as a subnet without a network security group. True or false? So Defender for Cloud used to be called Azure Security Center. You do want to make sure that you're familiar with these naming changes, but can we use Defender for Cloud to find network configuration deficiencies, yes or no? So the answer here is true. The free tier of Microsoft Defender for Cloud does identify configurations that deviate from best practices for network resources, as well as storage, compute, and several other services. You'll see these recommendations pop up under resource security hygiene. But intelligence, Hybrid threat protection, things formerly called advanced threat protection and regulatory compliance all require the standard tier of functionality, but there's quite a lot of capability in that free tier off the shelf. Question five, the free tier of Microsoft Defender for Cloud allows you to change the default policy to disable checks that you wish to ignore. True or false? So there's a default policy basically created with Azure policy in Defender for Cloud that has some off the shelf configurations that determine what recommendations are going to come up in your interface there. Can you ignore some of those? And the answer is true. You can change the default Microsoft Defender policy settings even in the free tier. You still won't get that advanced standard tier functionality, but you can at least be sure that the recommendations presented in the free tier are relevant to your environment. 
Number six, just-in-time VM access allows the requester to specify duration of access up to the configured maximum, true or false. So does the person requesting access to a VM through the just-in-time feature have any control over the duration of access they're granted? And the answer here is true. The requester is able to specify how much time is needed up to the maximum the service has been configured to allow for a specific VM. So if a VM has been configured to allow JIT access up to eight hours, the requester can specify that they'd like eight hours of access or they can crank the uh, selector down to a lower value. Number seven, Microsoft Defender for Cloud recommendations are listed in descending order of the severity of the security vulnerabilities they address. True or false? So remember, Defender for Cloud used to be called Azure Security Center. Are the recommendations listed in descending order of the severity? True or false? And the answer here is false. Recommendations are actually listed in descending order of the point value, their impact to the security score. Eight, which of the following solutions features automated security investigations? Is it one, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint? Two, Microsoft Defender for Cloud? Three, Azure Monitor? Or four, Microsoft Sentinel? So which of these solutions features automated security investigations? There is only one correct answer here. And the answer is one, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. So only Defender for Endpoint includes an automated investigation feature as of January 2022. Now response automation is possible in Sentinel with playbooks, but is not a full-scale automated investigation feature. There's you know, certainly a difference there because you're designing those playbooks or you're using sample playbooks from Microsoft, but a full-throated Automated investigation feature only happens in Defender for Endpoint. Nine, which of the following logs capture control plane operations in your Azure subscription? One, metrics. Two, diagnostic log. Three, activity log. Or four, subscription log. You'll definitely want to be familiar with which logs capture control plane operations and which capture data plane operations? And the answer here is for the activity log. So activity logs provide information about Azure Resource Manager control plane operations like create, update, and delete operations. And number 10. When you don't know how long you need to retain data in a blob, you can configure a legal hold. True or false? So if you don't know how long you need to retain data in a blob, you can configure a legal hold. Is this true or false? And the answer here is true. A legal hold remains in place until you release it, preventing the blob from being deleted. Number 11, you're configuring Azure policy. Which of the following policy effects require you to assign a managed identity? Choose two. One, append. Two, audit if not exists. Three, modify. And four, deploy if not exists. So of these four policy effects, which two require assigning a managed identity? And the answer here is three, modify, and four, deploy if not exists. And the reason is because these are right actions. So modify and deploy if not exists require a managed identity in order to carry out that right action, which will make a change, will perform a right action of some sort. Number 12, 
If you're deploying VMs using ARM templates, you want to include the enrollment into Azure Log Analytics as part of the deployment. Which two parameters must you include in the ARM template to automate that Log Analytics enrollment? One, workspace ID. Two, access key. Three, workspace key. Four, workspace name. So which of these two parameters will allow you to automate enrollment of a VM into Azure Log Analytics using an ARM template? And the answer here is one, workspace ID, and three, workspace key. So you'll need to provide the Log Analytics workspace ID and workspace key for the VM extension that deploys the agent. 13. Which Azure Platform Log captures data plane events? Is it 1. Resource Log 2. Activity Log 3. Azure AD Log or 4. Audit Log So which Azure Platform Log captures data plane events? We talked about control plane events just a bit ago. And the answer is one, resource log. So the resource logs provide insight into operations that were performed within an Azure resource, the data plane. So going back to the earlier question, the activity logs provide information about control plane operations like create, update, and delete operations that are taken uh, on the resource itself. 14. Playbooks in Microsoft Sentinel are based on which of the following technologies? Azure Automation Runbooks, Jupyter Notebooks, Azure Logic Apps, or Azure Functions. So what is the underlying technology leveraged by Microsoft Sentinel Playbooks? And the answer here is three, Azure Logic Apps. Your security playbooks are based on Logic Apps and they include specific triggers and actions to automate responses to alerts in Microsoft Sentinel. 15, which Microsoft Sentinel RBAC role is required to allow an analyst to manage incidents, like assign incidents, dismiss incidents, etc.? Choose the best answer. One, Microsoft Sentinel Reader, 2. Microsoft Sentinel Responder 3. Microsoft Sentinel Contributor or 4. Microsoft Sentinel Automation Contributor Definitely more than one possible role here that would allow those permissions. Give me the best one. And the answer is Microsoft Sentinel Responder, which can manage incidents, assign them, dismiss them. So can the Microsoft Sentinel contributor, but that role also includes authoring rights. Remember, least privileged access in all answers on the exam. 16. Which of the following statements is true for an Azure policy initiative? An initiative is 1. A policy assignment. 2 a policy assignment scope, three, a collection of policies, or four, a policy definition. Which of the following statements is true for an Azure policy initiative? This really comes down to just knowing the basics of Azure policy. And the answer here is a collection of policies, three. So an Azure initiative is a collection of Azure policy definitions that are grouped together towards a specific goal or purpose. 17. Which of the following are advantages of Azure Bastion over traditional remote desktop access? 1. The session is managed in the browser. 2. No public IP addresses are necessary. 3. 
It uses standard RDP ports. And four, it supports both Windows and Linux VMs. So give me unique advantages of Azure Bastion over traditional remote desktop access. There may be one, there may be more than one. Give me all that apply. And the answer is one, browser-based, and two, it uses private IPs. So Azure Bastion provides remote access directly from the Azure portal over port 443, connecting to private IP addresses of the target Azure VMs. 18. In Microsoft Sentinel, blank are groups of related blank that together create an actionable potential threat that you can investigate and resolve. So is it one, alerts are groups of related incidents, two, incidents are groups of related events, three, events are groups of related alerts, or four, incidents are groups of related alerts. So fill in the blanks for me. Only one right answer for this one. This means being familiar with Sentinel terminology. And the answer is four, incidents are groups of related alerts that together create an actionable potential threat that you can investigate and resolve. Sentinel uses analytics and machine learning rules to correlate low fidelity alerts into high fidelity incidents. 19. Azure policy allows the assignment of a policy to a management group. What level of scope is affected by a policy targeted to a management group? Is it one, all Azure subscriptions, two, all resource groups in a subscription, three, all subscriptions in the management group, or four, resource groups in the management groups? So what level of scope is affected by a policy targeted to a management group? And the answer is three, all subscriptions in the management group. So a management group facilitates targeting policy to multiple subscriptions of your choosing or all subscriptions in the tenant if you choose the root management group. 20. When creating alert rules in Azure Monitor for events in the Azure Activity Log, what must you configure to notify users when an alert is triggered? Is it one, resource, two, action group, three, target criteria, or four, alert logic? So when creating alert rules in Azure Monitor for events in the Azure Activity Log, what must you configure to notify users when an alert is triggered? And the answer is two, an action group, which is a collection of notification preferences defined by the owner of an Azure subscription. Azure Monitor and Health Service Alerts use action groups to notify users that an alert has been triggered. 21. An Azure Bastion host provides blank and blank connectivity to workloads sitting behind the Bastion host. So fill in the blanks. Is it SSH and HTTPS? Two, HTTPS and RDP? Three, SSH and RDP? Or four, RDP and HTTP? So essentially what two types of connectivity does an Azure Bastion host provide to workloads sitting behind that Bastion host? And the answer is three, SSH and RDP. So while you connect to the Bastion host on port 443 from the Azure portal, the Bastion host provides RDP connectivity to Windows and SSH connectivity to Linux in Azure VMs. 22. Just-in-time VM access and Azure Bastion are designed to work together. True or false? 
were these two features designed to work together? And the answer is false. Uh, the just-in-time VM access feature provides a gated solution for RDP and SSH to public IPs. Azure Bastion provides remote access via a browser and Azure Portal using a uh, VM's private IP. 23. Playbooks in Microsoft Sentinel use a special blank to instantiate an automated response using an Azure Logic app. Fill in the blank. Is it one? A special action, two, trigger, three, condition, or four, connector. So playbooks in Microsoft Sentinel use a special blank. So this really comes down to what is used to start that logic app. And the answer is two, trigger. Security playbooks are Azure Logic apps that use a special trigger designed for Microsoft Sentinel. Uh, your Logic apps have triggers and actions. This is really just understanding the basics of Logic app uh, components. 24. You notice that when you attempt to investigate an incident created from your custom rule in Microsoft Sentinel, that the investigation graph is empty. What is the most likely cause? Is it one, the rule is disabled, two, a permissions issue, an RBAC problem, three, query syntax, or four, entity mapping? So if the investigation graph, think visual investigation is empty, what is the most likely cause of the empty visual investigation screen? And the answer, is for entity mapping. You'll only be able to investigate the incident in the investigation graph if you use the entity mapping fields when you set up your analytics rule. Now this entity mapping has gotten smarter and easier over time, but the investigation graph requires that your original incident includes entities. Moving on to domain four. Question one. You can configure Azure AD authentication for which of the following? One, queues and blobs. Two, queues, blobs, and files. Three, queues, blobs, and tables. Or four, queues and files. So which of these Azure storage constructs support Azure AD authentication? So we're now talking about securing data and applications in domain four. Our answer here is one, queues and blobs. So only Azure storage queues and blobs support Azure AD authentication today. Number two, Microsoft Defender for App Service can be enabled for an app service plan only if the plan is associated with dedicated machines. True or false? So which app service plans can Microsoft Defender for App Service be enabled for? Does it require the plan have dedicated machines? True or false? And this answer has changed over time. So as of January 2022, the answer is false. Microsoft Defender for App Service supports all app service plans except Azure Functions on the consumption plan. So if it's not Azure Functions on the consumption plan, it should be supported by Microsoft Defender for App Service. Three, with Azure SQL, you can configure Azure AD domain services authentication. True or false? So with Azure SQL, you can configure Azure AD domain services authentication. And the answer is false. Azure SQL supports Azure AD authentication, but not Azure AD domain services authentication, which gives you managed domain services, including Kerberos and NTLM authentication. Four, 
Azure Disk Encryption uses BitLocker to encrypt OS and data volumes. True or false? Azure Disk Encryption uses BitLocker to encrypt OS and data volumes. True or false? And the answer here is true. So Azure Disk Encryption does utilize BitLocker, but only for Windows machines. DMCrypt is used for Linux VMs, uh, which may come up on the exam. So park that one in the back of your mind. Number five, you need to obfuscate data in Azure SQL at the record level. Which feature will you use? One, transparent data encryption. Two, Microsoft Defender for SQL, three, Azure AD authentication, or four, dynamic data masking. So we need to obfuscate data at the record level. So essentially we need to hide data, so to speak. So at the record level, we would use four, dynamic data masking sometimes simply called data masking or dynamic masking. This enables partially obscuring sensitive data like a credit card number or an email address. A couple of examples would be, you know, for example, uh, using asterisks to, uh, to blank out everything but the last four digits of a social or a credit card or part of an email address. No doubt you've seen this if you've ever made a purchase online. And that feature is available natively in Azure SQL, by the by. Number six, shared access signature or SAS tokens can be configured to restrict access by IP address. True or false? Can we restrict access by IP address using a SAS token with Azure Storage? And the answer is true. SAS tokens can restrict access to specific IPs or IP ranges for specific resources and if desired for a limited period of time. Seven, SAS tokens provide root access to an Azure storage account until the key is revoked or rolled. True or false? SAS tokens provide root access to an Azure storage account until the key is revoked or rolled. And the answer here is false. Root access until the key is revoked or rolled actually describes shared keys with Azure storage. SAS tokens are restricted to specified permissions for a limited period of time that you specify at creation time for that token. So SAS tokens give you greater control than the shared keys that come with that storage account by default, which really provide root access forever or until that key is rolled. Eight, Microsoft Defender for SQL can scan your Azure SQL databases weekly to identify vulnerabilities. True or false? Defender for SQL can scan your Azure SQL databases weekly to identify vulnerabilities. Is this one true or false? And the answer here is true. And the service can also scan SQL managed instance database and Azure Synapse. You can also set custom baselines for permission and feature configuration as well as database settings. Nine, you can enforce data residency and sovereignty using which of the following? One, Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Two, Azure Policy. Three, Azure Storage Encryption. Or four, Azure Automation. Which of these four would we use to enforce data residency and sovereignty?
And really the key here is data residency because that's going to determine sovereignty. Sovereignty is determined by where the data resides. The answer is to Azure Policy because Azure Policy enables you to configure an allowed locations policy to limit deployments to your approved Azure regions only. 10. You can use Azure AD authentication to secure Key Vault at the management plane. True or false? So for the exam, you will definitely need to understand Key Vault security uh, at the management plane and the data plane and the difference between those two. So can I secure a Key Vault at the management plane with Azure AD authentication? The answer is true. You can secure a Key Vault instance using Azure AD authentication. Absolutely. 11. Microsoft Defender for Cloud uses Azure Policy to configure default monitoring and remediation behaviors. True or false? So Microsoft Defender for Cloud, previously known as Azure Security Center. Definitely be familiar with the Microsoft Defender branding changes. So does Defender for Cloud use Azure Policy to configure default monitoring and remediation behaviors? The answer is true. It includes a default Azure policy. It contains a number of default settings that control monitoring and remediation behavior. And those settings can be customized even on the free tier. 12. You can limit operations on a key in Azure Key Vault by configuring the settings under permitted operations. True or false? You can limit operations on a key in Azure Key Vault by configuring the settings under permitted operations. So a key is a type of secret. And the answer here is true. You can limit a variety of operations under permitted operations like encrypt, decrypt, sign, and verify. 13. You can bind client certificates to which app service plan tiers? Is it one, isolated only, two, premium only, three, standard or premium, or four, basic, standard, premium, or isolated? To which app service plan tiers can I bind a client certificate? And the answer here is four, basic, standard, premium, or isolated. In fact, App Service supports client certificates across all four of these plans, and it is really the foundation for securing traffic to and from your app. So I'd be very familiar with all aspects of certificates on App Service, including configuration and certificate renewal. 14. Azure storage accounts are encrypted by default. One, always. Two, for premium storage only. Three, only for zone redundant storage, or ZRS. Or four, only for geo redundant storage, GRS. So when are Azure storage accounts encrypted by default? And the answer is one, always. All Azure storage accounts are always encrypted by default at the account level, at the service level. Customers can choose to manage their own keys for encrypting the storage service if they like, but that storage service encryption is always enabled. 15, a resource forest in Azure AD domain services will sync accounts from on-premises as well as Azure. True or false? A resource forest in Azure AD domain services will sync accounts from on-premises as well as Azure. And the answer is false. Only a user forest synchronizes accounts from on-premises Active Directory. 16. 
Microsoft recommends shared keys in Azure storage should be rolled automatically using which core service? Is it one, Azure App Service, two, Azure Key Vault, three, Logic Apps, or four, Azure Functions? So which of these four does Microsoft recommend should be used to roll your shared keys automatically in Azure storage? This process is well documented out in Microsoft Docs. And the answer is, four, is two, Azure Key Vault. So Microsoft recommends automating rolling of those storage account keys periodically, uh, exclusively with Key Vault. There are certainly other ways you could script it, but this is Microsoft's recommended route. 17, what types of authentication are supported as an access control measure to Azure SQL Database? Choose two. One, pass-through authentication. Two, certificate authentication. Three, Azure AD authentication. And four, SQL authentication. So which types of authentication are supported as an access control measure to Azure SQL? Pick any two of these. Correct answers are three, Azure AD, and four, SQL authentication. You can use traditional SQL authentication, which is user and password, or you can enable Azure AD authentication. Now your apps can use a connection string, but that's generally leveraging SQL authentication. 18, you can configure transparent data encryption for individual database columns containing your sensitive data. True or false? You can configure transparent data encryption for individual database columns. True or false? 19. And the answer here is false. Transparent data encryption encrypts the storage of an entire database using a symmetric key called the database encryption key. 19. You cannot configure always encrypted for your individual database columns containing your sensitive data. True or false? You cannot configure always encrypted for individual database columns. True or false? 20. And the answer here is false. You can encrypt individual database columns with always encrypted, which is a, a data encryption technology that ensures sensitive data never appears as plain text inside the database system. So you may be noticing a trend here in domain four. You're expected to know your way around data encryption in Azure SQL and SQL. So we've heard questions on transparent data encryption, always encrypted, and Dynamic data masking. Question 20. You create a new Azure Key Vault and you want to ensure that permanent deletions of secrets, keys, and certificates can be recovered for at least 30 days. Which two settings will you enable? One, soft delete. Two, delete lock. Three, purge protection. And four, read only lock. So which two settings will you enable to ensure that your deletions from Azure Key Vault secrets, keys, and certificates can be recovered for at least 30 days? And the answer is one, soft delete, and three, purge protection. So when soft delete is enabled, resources marked as deleted resources are retained for a specified period, 90 days by default. Purge protection ensures objects cannot be purged during that soft delete retention period. And it's worth mentioning, soft delete is on by default. In fact, it's something you can't turn off, but purge protection is optional. 21. You need to provide a user access to download content from your storage account limited to 24 hours. Which option should you choose? 1. Storage account firewall. Two, shared key, a storage account key. Three, 
storage blob data reader RBAC role, or four, shared access signatures. We need to give a user 24 hours of access to download content from our storage account. What is going to be the most time efficient way and effort efficient way to do that while implementing least privilege access? The answer is shared access signature. SAS tokens offer a variety of controls to limit time and scope of access where shared keys offer the equivalent of root access forever. So SAS tokens are really a go-to option. 22. In Azure SQL database always encrypted, two types of column encryption are supported. Choose both types from the list below. Deterministic. Two. Symmetric, three, randomized, and four, asymmetric. So which two types of column encryption are supported by Azure SQL Database Always Encrypted? And the two correct answers are one, deterministic, and three, randomized. So in Azure SQL Database, Always Encrypted supports deterministic and randomized encryption. Now do bear in mind, in deterministic supports equality, lookup, joins, and group by operations, but it is slightly less secure than randomized. 23. Which is the most accurate description of the transparent data encryption feature of Azure SQL Database? Is it one, table level encryption at rest, two, row level encryption in transit, three, row level encryption at rest, or four, database level encryption at rest? So which is the most accurate description of the transparent data encryption feature of Azure SQL Database? Incidentally, TDE goes all the way back to SQL 2008, I believe. This is not a new invention for Azure SQL. And the answer here is database level encryption at rest. So TDE performs real-time encryption and decryption of the database, the associated backups, and the transaction log files at rest without requiring changes to the application. But it is database level encryption, whereas always encrypted and dynamic data masking give us more granular encryption options for different use cases. 24. Azure storage accounts are exposed to the internet by default. Access is possible through which of the following methods? Choose all that apply. 1. Storage account key. 2. Shared access signature. 3. Master key. 4. Azure AD, RBAC permissions. So access is possible to Azure storage accounts on the internet through which of the following methods? Choose as many as are correct. And the answer here is one, storage account key, two, SAS, and four, Azure AD. So all of these are methods for accessing Azure storage. And if it's available from the internet, then so be it. 25. What PowerShell commandlet is used to initiate Azure Disk Encryption for a Windows or Ubuntu-based VM in Azure? Is it 1. Set-AZ VM Disk Encryption Windows 2. Set-AZ VM Disk Encryption Extension 3. Set dash AZ VM disk encryption Linux or four set dash AZ VM disk encryption. So how do we initiate Azure disk encryption for a Windows or an Ubuntu based VM? So there's only one correct answer here, which means you can pretty easily rule a couple of these out. And the answer is two set dash az vm disk encryption extension this is the command that we need for windows or linux we use the dash extension type parameter to specify our os type as windows or linux 
which will then determine if BitLocker or DMCrypt is the underlying technology that's used. 26. You need to implement security in SQL Server to ensure database admins never see sensitive customer information, such as credit card data, in databases that they manage. Which option should you choose? Is it 1. Row-level security? 2. Always encrypted? 3. Transparent data encryption? Or 4. Dynamic masking, aka dynamic data masking? So our goal here is to ensure that our database administrators even never see sensitive customer information in the databases that they manage. And the option that will achieve that goal for us is three, always encrypted, which allows clients to encrypt sensitive data inside client applications and never reveal the encryption keys to the database engine. As a result, always encrypted provides separation between data owner meaning the customer, and the manager, meaning the database admin. 27. Which options allow configuration of Key Vault secrets? Choose all that apply. 1. Azure CLI. 2. Azure PowerShell. 3. REST API. And 4. ARM Template. Which options allow us to configure Key Vault Secrets. Choose all that apply. And the answer is 1, 2, 3, and 4. Everything in the list. In addition to PowerShell, Azure CLI, the REST API, and ARM templates can all be used to configure Key Vault secrets. 28. When securing Azure Key Vault, you need to secure 1 the Azure Key Vault instance, which is the management plane, and two, the secrets hosted in the Key Vault. That's our data plane. Which controls are used for each? Choose the best answer. One, RBAC for both the instance and the secrets. Two, RBAC for securing the Key Vault instance and then either access policies or RBAC for the secrets. Three, Access policies for securing the Key Vault instance and RBAC for securing the secrets. And four, RBAC or access policies for securing the Key Vault instance and access policies for securing the secrets at the data plane. So, which of these combinations represents the most accurate description of the options available for securing our Key Vault? The answer is two. RBAC for securing the instance, and then either access policies or RBAC for securing the secrets in the vault at the data plane. That has evolved over time. There was a time where access policies were your only option for securing your secrets at the data plane, but RBAC support was added later. 29. Which of the following Azure tools can be used for detecting and remediating deviations from Microsoft's recommended security baseline for common workloads. Choose the best answer. One, Azure Monitor. Two, Desired State Configuration. Three, Azure Automation. Or four, Microsoft Defender for Cloud, which would have previously been called Azure Security Center. Do make sure you know those equivalents for the rebranded Microsoft Defender options. Get up to up to date on your naming conventions. The answer here is four, Microsoft Defender for Cloud. This functionality is built into Defender for Cloud, even in the free tier with the resource security hygiene. Microsoft offers a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to configure a baseline in Microsoft Defender for Cloud out in Microsoft Docs. 30. Which of the Azure RBAC roles below will allow you to create custom RBAC roles in Azure? Choose all that apply. One, contributor. Two, owner. Three, user access administrator. Or four, security administrator. So which of these Azure RBAC roles will allow you to create custom RBAC roles in Azure?
And the answer here is two, owner, and three, user access administrator. You need explicit permissions to create custom roles, and owner or user access administrator give you those explicit permissions. 31. How does Azure SQL Database provide protection for data at rest? 1. Dynamic masking. 2. Azure Storage Service Encryption. 3. Always encrypted. And 4. Transparent Data Encryption. So which provides protection for data at rest? And the answer here is transparent data encryption, four. So TDE performs real-time encryption and decryption of the database, the backups, and the transaction log files at rest without requiring changes to the application. 32. What is the minimum Azure Active Directory built-in RBAC role required to manage Azure Key Vault? Is it one, Key Vault Reader? Two, Key Vault Contributor? Three, Security Administrator? Or four, Privileged Role Administrator? So which of these is the minimum Azure Active Directory built-in RBAC role required to manage Key Vault? Remember, we need to consider least privilege access in choosing our answer. And the best answer here is two, Key Vault Contributor. This allows a user essentially full management rights of Key Vault without the ability to assign permissions to other users. So it's really a contributor role scoped to Key Vault. 33. What is the advantage of using an app service certificate in managing TLS SSL communication on your web app? Choose all that apply. 1. The certificate is stored in Azure Key Vault. 2. The certificate is issued by a trusted third party provider. 3. The certificate is self signed. 4. Renewal is managed by Azure. What are the advantages of using an app service certificate in managing your TLS SSL communication on your web app? And the answer here is one, it's stored in Azure Key Vault, two, issued by a third party, meaning it will be trusted by external entities, and four, the renewal is managed by Azure. Those trusted providers would include providers you've heard of such as DigiCert. And that automatic renewal is so handy, it just can't be overstated. And our big finish, number 34, you are configuring security using a managed identity for your custom web app. Which option will minimize administrative effort? One, a user managed identity. Two, a system managed identity. Three, a default managed identity. Or four, a service principal with contributor rights. So we're configuring security using a managed identity for our custom web app. Which option minimizes our administrative effort? And the answer here is system managed identity. Remember a system managed identity is lower effort than a user managed identity because its password is maintained automatically. It is also deprovisioned automatically when the associated resource is deprovisioned. So congratulations, you've reached the end of this AZ500 exam cram video practice exam. Remember to get the PDF copy of this presentation from the video description as well as links to free time limited access to my AZ500 exam prep series over on LinkedIn Learning. I hope you're getting value out of our content here at Inside Cloud and Security. Reach out anytime with questions and until next time, be well and stay safe.